Chapter 16 is all about lipid metabolism, and sadly, it is the last chapter that we're going to be covering in all of its full glory. And this is sad because there are many, many other nuances of metabolism that are worthy of our consideration. So we will be covering some of the highlights of nucleotide metabolism and amino acid metabolism, but we will not take time to cover the depths of chapter 15, which is arguably the most important metabolic process, and that is photosynthesis. So my hope is that right now I can convince you that you really, no matter whether you're studying pre-med or whether you're most interested in animal metabolism, I would like to encourage you to take a botany course because photosynthesis is the cornerstone process of primary producers. It is the process by which all of us depend upon for our lives because primary producers are the producers of of the sugar molecules which we consume. So not only is this paramount to all of our survival and of consideration to many, many medical issues, but it is also very, very important to any of you interested in energy and alternative energy. So a, a very important thing, and I wish we had more time to spend on it, but as many of you have already noticed, the pace of the class is high, and we only have so much time, and now we need to jump into the depths of lipid metabolism, beginning with the uh, absor absorption and mobilization of fatty acids. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to go grab a fatty snack. I want you to go get some ice cream because this will mean so much more if you can be degrading fats at the same time as we're thinking about how they are degraded. So in your ice cream, um, as you lick that, that cone, you're going to be taking in primarily triacylglycerols. So in the small intestine is the location where these triacylglycerols are going to be acted upon by the enzyme that's going to break them down. Now, this is a very famous enzyme called pancreatic lipase, and pancreatic lipase is going to act on triacylglycerols at two of the ester linkages, breaking them down so that it forms two free fatty acids and a single monoacylglycerol. So let's write this down, and then I'm going to remind you of the structure of a triacylglycerol, probably pretty fresh in your mind, but um, show you where those ester linkages are cleaved to form these two products. So pancreatic lipase um, hydrolyzes at carbon-1, the ester linkage at carbon-1 and carbon-3, producing two free fatty acids, which we know we don't want to hang around at too high a concentrations within cells. They can act as detergents and a two monoacylglycerol. That's what's left over after lipase goes at these. Now, lipase is going to become something that we're going to talk a lot about because not only is there dietary or pancreatic lipase, but there are also other, many other kinds of lipase that can become mobilized, for example, in adipose tissue. Now, pancreatic lipase is synthesized as a zymogen in the pancreas and then released and activated in the small intestine. So let's take a quick look, a review, at a picture from your textbook. It's figure 6.29, and it shows the action of pancreatic lipase, reminding us, um, and even with stereochemistry, reminding us that there are the three fatty acyl side chains attached to the glycerol backbone, and that carbons, the ester linkages at carbons 1 and 3 are cleaved, resulting in the release of two free fatty acids and a monoacyl glycerol. And so these are the um, breakdown products that can then be taken up into the um, intestinal cells. And that's where we're situated, right? Looking within the small intestinal the small intestine and the cell cells lining the small intestine and how they'll take up the fats because really ultimately that's the goal, right? There's a lot of energy in those fats. You want to be able to bring them in. Um, and of course, in, in, unless you're eating a snack with Olestra, which just passes right through you, the goal is to take in those fats. So this is what lipase is going to allow for then. And we'll see that it is not alone in its work. In fact, lipase is a water-soluble enzyme, and as you might guess, its propensity towards wanting to bind to very, very hydrophobic triacylglycerols is not super high. So it has a helper called colipase, and colipase is going to bind to the lipase enzyme and help it to keep its active site open, and it's going to kind of open it 
turn it to the open conformation and enable it to be more likely to bind the, the fatty the fat substrate or the triacylglycerol substrate. So colipase helps lipase bind, bind to water or bind to the lipid substrate and it kind of does that by activating it by holding it in the open conformation and allowing the active site to bind to that substrate. Before we go on with the rest of our coverage, I wanted to take just a minute to talk to you about a drug called Ally. And in fact, a few years back in 2007, Ally hit the scene and there was a huge spread about it in the um, Rocky Mountain News. And I actually want to show you this spread and uh, it's called Ally, Friend or Foe. And it talks a little bit about the drug as it was here hitting the scene. Coming this summer, the first FDA-approved over-the-counter diet drug and a controversial weapon in the war on obesity. Some experts say that the new fat blocker speeds up weight loss, while others say it's ineffective with nasty side effects and even nas nastier consequences down the road. Is it for you? And the spread goes on um, inside here to talk about what Ally is. Um, it says it's the over-the-counter over version of the prescription drug Xenical or Orlistat, one of the new class of anti-obesity drugs at known as lipase inhibitors. So essentially, this is what Ally does, is it inhibits the action of pancreatic lipase. So it means that it stops the breakdown that we just looked at, stops the cleavage at the carbon-1 and 3 ester linkages, and stops you from breaking down fat. So before we look at the cons of this particular drug, let's think about it and think about if we could predict those cons. Um, in fact, I'll situate it in a story. A few years back, my cat Zena, uh, she woke up one morning and she was feeling terrible. She was hiding under the bed and things were bad. And I rushed her into the vet and once I got into the vet, I started to figure out what was going on, but it turned out that she was just extremely constipated. Now, the vet ended up telling me to feed her a lot of vegetable oil so that it would just cause her bowels to slip right through. Now, I don't know how I feel about this vet, but it is helpful in our story in thinking about what happens if you do take something that inhibits pancreatic lipase. Things just pass right through you. So let's read about the cons of this drug. Effects can include gas, um, oily discharge, diarrhea, bowel urgency, and anal link leakage. Study participants who stopped using the drug regained all of their lost weight. <laughs> so there are some cons to this, right? And we can laugh a bit about them. However, we should also think about something very important, and that is that the potential for this drug to be abused. For example, somebody who has a great weight conscious, think about the bulimic young woman who who is trying to think about ways to lose weight and fit into that socially conscious identity of a teen. What about abuse of this drug? Well, a lot of doctors are, have argued that, oh, this isn't going to be abused. This isn't a problem. And for example, here's a quote from this article from one of those doctors. It's Dr. David Katz. And he says, anal leakage is not likely to be too socially acceptable among image conscious teens or anyone else for that matter. And that's his argument that this won't be abused. Abused. Well, think about it this way. Is it very image conscious to make yourself throw up with bulimia? Not so much. But in fact, it is still something that through social pressures is something that is done a lot. I think this is something that we need to think about with abuse of the drug. And if you would like, um, I'll start a, an online discussion for this and we can think about whether or not we can see find abuses uh, for the drug ally and talk a little bit about it online. So once pancreatic lipase has gone to work on the triacylglycerols, and we have our two free fatty acids and our monoacylglycerol, at this point, the bile salts come into play. And remember the bile salts with their polar head group and their long fatty side chain, remember they act like detergents, and like good detergents, they emulsify these products of triacylglycerol digestion. So we get an emulsification, we get the formation like good detergents do of micelles. So the micelle forms trapping the free fatty acids and the monoacylglycerol and allowing for this emulsification. And from 
within this uh, micelle, the micelle can transport the products of of fat degradation over to the intestinal cell wall lining where they are absorbed and get this this is where it gets really crazy once inside of the cells of the intestinal cell wall lining they're actually re-esterified that is a sexy way to say that the triacylglycerols are put back together so the linkages at um, the carbon 1 and 3 that were broken before are now formed again, re-esterification. So we now see the formation of the complete triacylglycerol once it's been transported into the intestinal cell. So you can think of this as actually quite literally um, a very brief breakdown to enable um, uptake and then from there we get re-esterification. Now, perhaps one of the things that I most like to think about is what happens to the bile salts after they transport the free fatty acids and the monoacylglycerol to the intestinal cell wall lining. The bile salts themselves pass down through most of your lower intestine regions, and they are themselves then taken up. They then travel through the hepatic portal blood back up to the liver, where then they're recycled and sent to the small intestine again, where they can do their whole job again of emulsifying emulsifying those products of fat breakdown. So here's what I like to think about when I'm having a fatty snack. Um, I just think about what a workout I'm giving my bile salts, you know, so I can sit back and say, oh, so good. I'm really giving my bile salts a workout today. Can you imagine how many laps they're doing? Um, because they're making laps essentially as they go down, uh, get taken up again, passed to the liver, and then sent back to the small intestine. So within a given meal, your bile salts may make many laps, right, depending on your fat consumption. So um, we're kind of giving them a workout whenever we eat a fatty snack. So imagine at this point you're thinking, well, Rachel, I know that triacylglycerols are the primary lipid that we take in in our diet, but don't we also take in a certain amount of other kinds of lipids? You know, for example, if we, if we eat anything else that is alive, we're also taking in phospholipids. So let's take a moment to look at the degradation of a phospholipid, reminding ourselves that it too will be, need to be broken down into smaller components in order to be taken up by the intestinal cell wall lining. And this is done by phospholipases none other. So remember all the conversation we had about the phospholipases that are found in snake venom? Well, phospholipases can also be dietary phospholipases and can help us to degrade any kind of um, phospholipid, a glycerol phospholipid, for example, that might have been in our diet. Phospholipase A2 is the one that we talk so much about, and the intestinal phospholipase A2 will likewise cleave at the ester linkage at carbon 2. So we'll see the high hydrolysis at that um, point and the formation of two breakdown byproducts. Of course, one of those is a free fatty acid. The other one is called lysophosphoglyceride. And lysophosphoglyceride is simply what's left after the fatty acyl side chain at carbon 2 has been removed and there is a single, uh, single long hydrocarbon tail at remaining esterified at carbon 1. Let's just take a quick minute to look at that, even though I have a feeling this is very fresh in your mind, um, but we'll bring this up. And you can see here the action of phospholipase A2 at the ester linkage uh, at carbon 2 and the removal or loss of a 1-free fatty acid and the lysophosphoglyceride. Now these products of digestion are small enough to be taken up by in the, the intestinal cell wall lining and once again, once they are back into the intestinal cell, they're basically re-esterified and put back together again. So we recognize then um, that lysophosphoglyceride and the free fatty acid are absorbed by the intestinal cells. Once inside, they're re-esterified to glycerol phospholipids. But what about if you chose a, a fatty snack that might contain a little bit of cholesterol? And that needs to be taken up as well, right? But the thing about cholesterol is that it doesn't have to be further broken down before it can be taken into the intestinal cells. And in fact, it can be emulsified as, as it is. 
and solubilized by biosalts and absorbed. But what's really interesting is once it's inside of those intestinal cells, it's made even more hydrophobic by the addition of an added moiety, making it into a cholesterol ester. And I went back to chapter 9 because that's where this very, very hydrophobic molecule is pictured. So let's take a moment to look at the form of, a, of cholesterol that forms once it's brought in to the intestinal cell. Notice that while an additional hydrophobic group added onto an already very hydrophobic molecule. So if possible, boy, I tell you, this is even more hydrophobic than cholesterol itself.